my name is Tanaka, as he said, I'm one of the organizers of the Tech Leadership Meetup, for those who are here for the first time. My co-organizers, uh, Benny and Roberto, are out of town this week, so they kind of left me alone to run with it. Um, yeah, the Tech Leadership Meetup, for those who haven't been here, uh, is a community for technology <coughs> leaders, so whether you are a leader who's been working as a leader for a long time, or someone who's just become a leader, or someone who's aspiring to be a leader sometime in the future, the community, we set it up so that we can all meet up and have engaging discussions that help us to become better leaders in, in, the, tech, in the tech companies we work at, with the idea that if we improve all the different companies that people work at, then we basically improve the whole tech industry. So welcome, We've, uh, we host a hybrid of meetups uh, in person on one month and then uh, virtual um, the following month. They're always on the first Tuesday. So the next one will likely be virtual um, on Zoom. Um, so just to kick off, a couple of yeah, small house rules. So as you can see, the talk is getting recorded um, and uh, photos may be captured as we go along. If you have an issue with that, feel free to come chat with me afterwards. Um, normally, when the speaker is speaking, we'll let him run through his talk, and then at the end, uh, there will be questions that can be asked. It's up to the speaker if he's happy with you stopping him somewhere along the way. If you really have a pressing question that's, per that's on that slide, that should be fine, but uh, generally we'll have a uh, question and answer thing at the end. Um, we also understand that you may have a pressing issue that you need to step out for and you need to head out, so that's fine. We'd love to have you stay in, but then if you need to head out, please do. Um, then yeah, just a shout out to our sponsors, so one of our sponsors is Peach Payments, uh, so thank you so much for supporting us and helping us host events like this, so things like getting the snacks and stuff like that is through their sponsorship. Um, if you are interested in what Peach Payment does, please visit peachpayments.com uh, and you can check out what they do uh, and they might be able to facilitate something for your company or some side project you're working on. Then of course, opposite. Uh, they are also one of our sponsors. They provide us with swag at all our events, even the virtual ones. They get the swag delivered to your place. Um, and today, of course, we actually get to use the office, so double on that one. So thanks to Office Zen, uh, and I think uh, he's already mentioned everything Office Zen does. So if you're currently on the job market looking for a job, you could use Office Zen as a platform, or if your company is recruiting, uh, you could use Office Zen to find. Uh, all the talented developers that we have out here. We have a tech leadership newsletter. Uh, this is uh, an email you receive once a month with a curated list of uh, tech leadership content that we found over the month that we think will be interesting and valuable for anyone who's interested in tech leadership. Um, you can get the QR code or you can go to that link. You can also just go to our website, techleadership.co.za. It's probably easier through that and just go to the newsletter link and you can sign up and then you should receive an email. It goes out after the meetup. So it'll go out once a month. It goes up, out after the meetup at around 8 p.m. today. You receive a link and then you receive another one a month later. We're also on Twitter and on Twitter it's more frequent. You get links almost daily on interesting tech leadership content we find that's shared across. And then we also announce our events and upcoming things. So if you're also on Twitter and that's your way of following what's happening, uh, we're on Twitter on at TechLeadershipX. Um, and then yeah, I've mentioned the swag part. This we also use for our virtual meetup link. If you haven't gotten swag as you entered, uh, please make sure you don't leave without and get the office in uniform. And yeah, to the exciting part, uh, the star of the show today is not me, but it's actually Joel, <laughs> engineering <laughs> manager at, uh, at LUNO. Um, and Joel today is going to share with us some of his lessons in his journey at LUNO, working at LUNO, um, <coughs> with one of the youngest teams in the company and uh, rebuilding tech. So excited to have him and let's give him a big round of applause as he comes up. Hi everybody. Hey, oh, oh, okay. We can just start this one again. Hi everybody. Hey, okay, awesome. I like a little bit of a responsive room. There's free space here. It's not just for my wife, but if you feel like you need a more comfortable couch space, you can come here, which is totally fine. So just don't sleep on the couch. It's a bit weird. But anyway, it's such an honor to be here. And Tanaka and the team, thank you so much for having me. And Offizen, thank you for welcoming us. 
we never saw your office, now we know. Office looks pretty good. <laughs> anyway, that, but now thank you so much for your passion for the community and the tech space. So yeah, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, like, like I say, my name is Joel, or like my mother will call it Joel. I, uh, I'm very excited to be sharing today. And uh, yeah, I hope we'll have some interesting conversation to say the least. If my talk is pretty bad, you have free pizza and free beer. So at least <laughs> you got something out of the, the session today. So yeah, today we'll be touching on a topic that I'm very, very much passionate about, which is the intentional pursuit of building great engineering teams and rebuilding tech. Pretty long title, I love it. I thought it would pretty be easy for people to remember. Oh, what was that guy who talked? It was a very long title. That's a good catch, a good way of remembering that. So. That's a little bit of what we'll be touching on quickly. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, look at that. I look even slides and moving motions. Anyway, I got everything sorted. And this is the, you know, the agenda, basically for tonight. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to make this talk to be deaf by slides. And you go home, you're already tired. You came from work, so I'm very mindful of that. But it's just going to be pretty straightforward. A quick introduction of who I am. We're going to be looking at this idea of the pursuit, the rebuild, and then the intentionality to self, and then some questions. So we can keep the questions to the end. Uh, that's basically that. Next slide, please. Wonderful. Okay, who am I? That's basically me in a picture, a couple of things missing, but basically that's who I am. Uh, I'm a husband, so that's my wife, Georgie. We've been married for three uh, and a half years. I have the wedding dates on my ring, just in case, you know, forget I have that there, <laughs> extra points, not just you have a free, free tip for any guy, anyway, let's just move on, and then I'm also a dog dad, so that's my two dogs, a cock of spaniels, that's Bailey on the far left hand side, and that's Cash, uh, yeah, I just absolutely love them, and statistics shows that if you put a dog picture on any slides, people are engaged more, so there you have it, <laughs> so now you're engaged, and I'm originally from Congo. Why is that? Because if my accent sounds weird, you can't understand things, you can blame it on where I'm from. I'm French, so sorry about that one there. But I'm originally from Congo and I'm very proud of that one. And then I'm engineering manager at Luno. I'm a chef. I actually released a cookbook a couple of years ago. So yeah, it didn't make it pretty big, but at least it's out there. I can say that I'm it's out there. I did it. And then uh, I love CrossFit. I'm a fitness lover. That's something. And I'm also a consultant. That is something that I'm very passionate about because, yeah, I got to learn quite a few things. I feel like I want to add value to others, and that's basically what it is. So, yeah, that's basically that. So, next slide, please. All right. So, at Luna, we have a little bit of a tradition, which is every engineering meeting needs to start with a little bit of a joke, just to lighten the mood. People are a little bit tense. You don't know what's going to happen. So, I have 12 jokes because 12 months in the year. You know, you get one one joke for every single month. You know, I'm not gonna see you, but you know, let's just assume that we've been we've known each other for 12 months. So here's a couple of jokes to just kind of keep things a little bit light, and then we're gonna get straight into the meat of the conversation. Somebody is laughing. I know I'm doing a good job already. So here we go. The first one is, what is the biggest lie in the entire universe? I've read and agreed the terms and the conditions. <laughs> that is the thing I don't. Want. Yeah. How does a computer get drunk? Take screenshots. <laughs> yeah. Tough crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard of that new band? 1023 megabytes. They're pretty good, but they don't have a gig just yet. <laughs> Um, all the engineers in the room are like, oh yes, I get that one there. I'm not going to explain it, otherwise it's going to be a pretty bad joke. I'm assuming it's a good joke, so let's just keep moving. And then, why did the computer show up at work late? It had a hard drive. <laughs> How many programmers does it take to change a light bulb? None, because it's a hardware problem. <laughs> That's true. Why did the developer become so poor? Because he used up all his cash. <laughs> Sorry about that one then. They're all very much software development jokes. So. I'm laughing inside because I'm like, this is brilliant. I don't know why you're not. Anyway, what is the programmer's favorite highway? Google. Anyway. <laughs> 
What would a baby call uh, a baby computer call his father? Data. <laughs> anyway, we can endure four more and then we will get straight into more interesting things. Um, what does uh, what shoes do computers love the most? Rubber boots. And why did the computer go to the dentist to get his Bluetooth checked? Uh, that was a good one. Thank you very much for that laugh. <laughs> Compassionate laugh. Uh, two more, and then we'll get going. What is another name for Apple juice? iPhone chargers. <laughs> At least everybody get that one then. Eh? How was the cell phone wedding ceremony? The wedding was terrible, but the reception was amazing. Anyway, that's uh, 12 not so funny jokes just to lighten the mood a little bit, and now we can get into you know the mid of it. And uh, next slide, please. And what is basically the concept of what we're going to be talking about, and what is it? And the whole idea is basically that great teams and great tech and great product don't just happen. They just don't magically happen. You know. They are built with hard work, purpose, diligence, intentionality, and a few bucks. I just added a few bucks a few minutes ago now just to make it, you know, it's the reality of basically what it is. And that's basically what we're going to be talking about. What does it take to build a great team? You know, a lot of the product that we see out there is very easy to admire the end product, but like, what does the journey look like? What does the journey of looking after the people? you know, who are building it, what does it look like? And that's basically what we're going to be touching base on tonight. So we're going to be starting with the next one, which is the first one, actually, which is, sorry, next slide, please. The pursuit activity of a, a specified kind building great engineers. So I love words purely because I'm French, English was kind of a bit harder for me, so I tend to always research word and try to find the meaning so that I'm making sure that I'm not talking crap. And the whole title, the intentionality pursuit of building great engineering team is something that I was pretty much like trying to really, really get to the bottom of it. And as tech leaders, this whole idea of building teams, not even just tech, any teams, you have to be very intentional about the way you go about it. And what does it take actually? And I truly believe that it's a pursuit because you just don't have a plan and then you execute it and then forget about it and then 12 months later come check on it. And I feel like every single day there are things that you gotta do to help you move things forward. And that's basically what is the whole idea of this first chapter of the conversation, which is the pursuit. So one of the things that I love, or at least at the beginning of the year that I agreed in my heart to do is I had to, I had to agree to rethink the way I want to do everything, and that's one of the things that chatting to different tech leaders and so on. That is one of the hardest thing that in tech we don't really get easy to rethink a way of doing something. Traditionally, statistics shows that engineers are hard to rethink a solution if they truly believe it's a great solution. But I think on the tech leader side of things. Our goal is to help engineers to rethink the way of thinking. Sounds a bit hard, sounds a bit crazy, but I think that is the approach that we're going to be doing. So when you are talking about building a team, it takes intentionality to help rethink a lot of the ways people have done things across life. And that's basically what it is. So the word intentional basically means it's a way of doing something with purpose deliberately. And I think the word purpose there as a tech leader means everything. And I think the question that I have for everybody, whether you're a tech leader or not, or you're in the tech space or not, I think is in everything that you do, do you know what is your purpose? Because I think for me, one of the, thing, one of the things that changed for me was to actually realize why did I want to become an engineering manager or a tech leader? <coughs> I had to ask myself that question because one of the things is in the industry, in the tech industry, as I know, is there is a lot of jobs on the market and there is a lot of opportunities everywhere. Which one do you know is a good one for you? Maybe it offers more money. I think you might be in that season of life, perfectly fine. But I think for me is just getting to that place where I had to realize that there gotta be a purpose behind everything that I'm doing. Otherwise it just becomes about pushing lines of code or doing something pretty great 
and then clocking out very quickly statistics shows once again that it gets pretty depressing very quickly that the purpose behind everything that you do actually anchors you for your life it helps you to get up every single morning to know that I'm adding value to something that is greater than myself there are seasons definitely where that might not actually connect but you have for longevity sake you gotta get to a place where you actually find a purpose behind everything that you do and how do you find that purpose and I think it, it, it comes down to the things that you're passionate about some of your values the things that actually really help you that excite you and I think that is that journey so for me as an engineer manager as a tech leader my journey of building a great team is helping them unlock that one of the biggest advice that I got from one of my mentors was you will get to a place where you're gonna have to leave this company one day it's like as much as I don't want to see you go you get to a place where you're gonna have to leave the company my, my goal or my role in this journey is to help you become the best version of yourself and I think that absolutely changed my, my journey with him because I realized that it was more it was more invested in me than I was actually invested in our relationship between him as my manager and I think that's the journey that actually I started applying I'm like how do I become so involved and invested in this person's development that when they leave my interaction with them become one of the best things that could have happened to their career and then there's one quote that I saw on LinkedIn a couple of months ago was that people somebody said that people don't leave companies they leave bad managers kind of true in a way but if you had to think very much about your journey about your career the interaction that you had with your bad managers a bad manager makes it very easy to leave no matter how great the company is because your interaction with the company this person the manager becomes a representation of the company because you might not talk to the CEO every single day you might not even you know know who the CEO is but effectively is this manager represent the whole company so as manager as leader we become to have this we have this job which is to represent the company in a way and when there's no purpose attached to that you become from task to task to task and then what COVID told us is that people get very tired of that inter interaction where when it's just transactional you feel like I'll oh, just do a job and move on people very quickly checked out of that story and I think in this idea of the pursuit is just kind of getting to the bottom of number one finding out for you as a tech leader what is your purpose you know and I truly believe that the purpose will go far beyond just the company it has to be not just for what you basically do but it will basically go through and encompasses your, your whole life like okay what do I want to get out of the job and that's basically what the, this whole idea a lot of heavy things I said maybe no just let's just move on but I think that is basically this whole idea of the pursuit starting with this idea of the pur of your purpose for me I became aware of that a few years ago I was a tech lead at Luno and then one of the things that I loved doing was that um, I just loved sitting down with people when somebody was like hey can you help me with the task I just loved sitting down with people and going through the journey of helping them through code but also trying to coach them a little bit and trying to figure out like okay how do you build like how do I help you now but also kind of give you skills that might help you next time and then more and more in that journey I became to finding out like okay I absolutely love spending time with people and helping them grow and that became part of the journey of figuring out my purpose that I really really love doing this and there's a lot more to it but I think that was the beginning for me where I started introspectively looking at myself and being able to figure out like okay what is this thing all about and what do I want to get out of it and that was something that fueled me my wife will tell you I'm one of the few people where we go on holiday I genuinely cannot wait to go back to work I genuinely cannot work because the work that I do excites me and I found really I found fulfillment in a lot of those different things outside the just like the mundane job but like the people I got to build the teams that I got to build absolutely love it some of them will probably go and they will move on but I think the relationship and the way we've built things it's actually just excite me and that is some of the ways that I found about my purpose is everybody still with me yeah. nobody's sleeping yeah. great awesome all right so there's no secret that great engineer look 
you know, when it comes to good, engineer, uh, good engineers, they look for a couple of things. You know, we all know that, you can read about it. They look for great culture, a sense of community and belonging, you know, a clear vision and a clear purpose in terms of the products. What are we trying to achieve as a product? They're looking for growth, both career and financially. No brainer. Autonomy, they want to be able to like, hey, trust them, like they can get something done. Like you give them something, they don't want to be micromanaged. That is, you know, around the world, that's basically what it is. And then they look for technology. We love new tech, the latest tech. That is what, great, what engineers look for. You know, and then at the end of the day, they look for great benefits. You can chat to office and they'll let you know about that. Like, it is very competitive, but like best benefits. Why? Because all of those things really matter to us, right? If those things matter to engineers, then it should matter to us. But as tech leaders, we only have, we can only influence so much out of that entire journey of all, all of those different lists. There's only a few things that we can influence. But for me, I think, here's some of the things that I feel like you can influence in terms of this pursuit of building great engineering team is that you can create environments where you believe in their abilities. And that's something that will unlock their confidence in doing the job. And that is something that, irrespective of who you are, you can create that for yourself. Even as a tech leader or as a peer, you can create an environment where you believe in your colleague. And then when they don't have the right skills, you can actually invest in them. And that is the first one. The second one is that you can create an environment where they can grow. And growth looks completely different. Growth, you know, traditional way you have what we call the engineering ladder, different companies call it different, different things, where it's basically a, pro a, a progression of moving between one stage to the other. Some, you know, a year you're a, C you're a junior, you move to mid-level, you move to senior, and so on. Different, you know, not just in tech, different companies and different fields have all of those different things. But one thing I realized is that sometimes it becomes very hard to promise that or to guarantee that just because the team might be small, your company might be a startup, you can't really guarantee all of those different things. But when we're talking about growth, I actually, feel, I actually believe that people are looking for forward momentum because they are not unrealistic. If the company is five people, you know, and then within a year's time, they're not expecting to be senior. But they're looking for forward momentum. What does forward momentum look like? How do you break down different projects so that different people can grow in specific areas? And I think that's how you can think about it when it comes to growth, because it can look completely different in different seasons, but I feel like forward momentum is what they're looking for. They want to be able to master a new skill, like, you know, a couple of months down the line. And that is something that you can be able to offer them. One of the ways I personally do it is like, if we are planning a project, the traditional way is that I'll look after the project. I'll probably pick a project to start with, like, okay, I'm not going to look after that project. I'll help the person, but I'll get somebody else who I feel like might require the skills to grow, and then I'll be able to mentor them. Okay, you look after what I was supposed to look after. It looks like this, and this is how you can run with it. The second time when I'll get them, or I'll get somebody else, same thing. And I think that's some of the ways that you can basically be doing, looking at it. And I think it actually really worked well for me. So the other one is give them problem, a complex problem to solve, and then I scratch out the word complex. And I think generally when you're building a team, people want problem to solve. They want to be able to feel like they are doing, they are adding value, they are solving a real problem to the company, not just all of the low hanging fruits. Sometimes it happens there's low hanging fruit to look after, but I think solving problems becomes part of what engineers look for. And that is something that I can help them as a leader to figure out like, how do you solve big problems? And how do you go about that? The other one is give them, the, uh, give them a purpose behind the task. Traditionally, the way we used to it is that here's a project, we are building this, here's the end product that we are looking for, go for it. There's nothing wrong with that, but I think it becomes very much mundane and very easy to go through that and people start getting tired of like, I don't really know how this specific project connects to company goals and how, do, how are we moving things forward. But I think giving a purpose behind what you are building changes the relationship completely because you are, you are tackling it from an angle of, here's a problem, we know that we want to get to a specific solution, but across the journey, we need to figure out this because we are trying to solve this. 
this is how we can get there and then being part of that process of solving the problem and then realizing that by doing something they are they can easily connect that to a company goal or they can easily connect that to something far down the line changes the relationship completely from just doing one task to another task to another task to figuring out oh, okay by doing this specific task here's how i'm adding value and so on and some tasks they might not just be some values but i feel like the idea giving the thinking behind a specific project and beyond a specific task adds so much value because sometimes for us is that i've already solved that in my head and i just want them to execute it but i feel like it's it's a very it's one of those it's one of those things very quickly becomes higher for engineers they want to look for more they want to be able to get involved to get their hands dirty in solving the problem with you and that is the journey that i feel like become adds more fulfillment but at the end of the day i feel like as an engineer manager as, a, as an engineering leader that leading engineering teams becomes a little bit of a mix between a science and art a science because we have a list that i just listed of what great engineers look for you can add a lot of different data metric points and you know exactly how to build a high performing teams in terms of adding trust and confidence and all of those different things there's a science between behind how you can get there and i think the art part becomes into the journey of being a little bit more human and connecting with your team and sitting down with people and trying to figure out actually what makes them better because what might work for me might not work for you and that's why i say it's not a formula between like okay here's the five things you can do execute them and that's it and then you have a great team and i think that's where the art part becomes where very easily you'll figure out that one person in your team what worked for them might not work for the other person on that journey the way you figure out is becoming a little bit more human than just completely executing something where just chatting with them and trying to figure out how to get them to a specific point and what triggers them what works for them what is the enneagram tap why do i mention that because different people perceive things differently and they execute things differently i'm an enneagram tap one i am a strict perfectionist so it works well in some instance in some instance it doesn't really work well and if you had to approach leading me or managing me the same way you will approach in any event tech aids it becomes a bit harder you might have a little bit of a roadblocks and if you are going into a robotic mode of like let me execute this plan for this person to another person it becomes very hard that's why i said it, it's more of a combination of a heart so what are some of the things that you can basically be able to on the art part of things what are some of the things that you can do maybe revisiting what you're one-on-one -on -one with every single one of your direct reports or engineer could be another way of doing it so usually what are you talking to in a one-on-one -on -one? so i have one-on-one -on -one with all of my engineers uh usually it used to be weekly i'm moving to about weekly just because they got too many of them and it's just the way we do it in a one-on-one -on -one, one of the week we just kind of focus in terms of like very quickly before we jump into work connecting with them not for the sake of it because i'm really genuinely interested in knowing what's going on in their lives because with covid we realized that what impacts uh, some of the things that impact them at home will impact the work so i think being connected with them becomes very interesting so in a one-on-one -on -one, really genuinely posing connecting and not asking questions for the sake of fun and answering it asking questions for the sake of being connected and trying to figure it all out so making and adding purpose behind your one-on-one -on -one. one of the things that we basically i learned from one of my old manager is once in a year do this exercise which we call the two of duty which looks a little bit like this basically it's a statement and you give an engineer time to think about it within a month and they can basically fit it in and just trying to figure out like okay what does the growth look like? the leader and the person that you are managing is getting to a place where you can help them help somebody else and i think that is something that really unlocks your purpose and trying to figure out exactly what triggers you and what really helps you so for me by doing this exercise i get to connect with them and really help them on the journey of figuring out what is it that they want out of their career and the second one is them also helping somebody else on the team and that's how you can go about it
Awesome. Next slide. Are we still here? Yeah. Yeah. Is this helping somebody? Yes. Okay. Anele, thank you. At least it's helping you. All right. So this idea of the rebuild. Um, in this idea, we'll be touching on something called the illusion of explanatory death. Big words. But basically, it's a psychological term and thinking process that basically, the gist of it is that the way we think about system or complex problem isn't actually the way the problem works. And I'll break it down a little bit in this idea. Why did I mention rebuilding tech there? Not just because it's a tech meetup, but purely because this whole idea of leading people in the tech space, part of it and most of it involves rebuilding things. It involves breaking down things and figuring out how to go about it. So, well, the truth is that the topic comes up more time than we might want it. But usually people will tell you that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But I think for me as a tech leader, it's just trying to figure out like, okay, how do you take people from one point to the next point? And how do you continuously grow them is by being a little bit, you know, because I'm closer to the business side of things, figuring out where the business is heading and trying to figure out what are the trends, what are some of the things that you know, problem that we are solving and we're gonna be rebuilding. And that is basically why rebuilding is there. So I think we're naturally inclined to fix things and the best way to do that is, you know, kind of going into this journey of understanding what problem we're trying to solve and then rebuilding it and so on and so on and so on. But this is basically rebuilding becomes part of the journey of every engineer. And you know, it gets very tiring and all of those different things. But I just wanted to kind of break down a couple of different principles that I personally used with the team and I feel like it really adds value and ultimately they get to look at it from a career perspective and see how it would add value to them. So here's some of the things or principles and things that are tools that I've used and I think it actually becomes very really important. And um, one, of the, one of them for me as a leader is uh, having the humility to find out what I don't know. Sometimes, because I'm closer to the business, you tend to either be in like hands-on, you know exactly how everything going, uh, going on, but sometimes you get to a place where you actually just don't know, and you need to trust the expert in your team to be able to really help you on the journey. But having the humility to be like, I actually don't know this problem. One of the things that I'll tell a lot of things, a couple of friends are here, I usually tell Velani a lot in our chats is that, my goal as a leader is not to be the MVP of the team. That's not my role. If it is yours, perfectly fine, there's no problem with that. But I think for me, what really helped me is putting this pressure off myself to be like, I have to be the MVP of the team. No, I think for me is I want to build a team of MVPs. And I want to be able to be the coach and really helping them figuring out, like, okay, what is the strength? What is the weakness? How do they move? How do they get, you know, to execute the project effectively, how do they do all of those different things. And in that journey of rebuilding things, number one for me is having the humility to find out what I don't know and already asking questions. The other one is being able to accept the foreign concepts. Statistics show that engineering leaders are the worst at, a, at a learning a new concept when the idea didn't come from them. Ouch. The other one is to acknowledge when I am wrong. In this idea of rebuilding things, you'll be like, okay, sometimes I might lead the team in this direction and then very quickly it doesn't really work. But because we're in an agile space, very quickly we can shift, refocus, and then go again. But when I'm wrong, being able to have the humility to be like, actually, I was wrong in that specific case. Where do you guys think we should go? And I think that's something that I've learned about rebuilding tech. The other one is to seek excellence, not perfection. And I think it's very hard for me because I'm an Enneagram type one, like I mentioned. So I'm like, I'm always inclined to like, okay, if you're not perfect, we're not gonna build it. But very quickly really like, okay, we're in an agile space. How do we best build it? One of the things that a friend of mine once told me, and I love it, is that first, do it. Secondly, do it better. And the sec thirdly, do it best. So how do we take the first step? The other one is to recognize the effort of others. When it comes to rebuilding, one of the things uh, from the statistic that I've pulled through is that tech leaders are the worst at recognizing when giving others credit. 
when somebody does a good job, when it comes to this whole idea of rebuilding tech, oh, what happened to the TV? Anyway, but just being able to recognize when people do good work. So, this whole idea that I mentioned before is the illusion of explanatory depth. The concept is basically this, that our belief that we understand more about the world that we actually do is often not until we are asked to actually explain a concept that, we've, uh, that we come face to face with our limited understanding. So, when we are rebuilding tech, and this whole idea of like the principle that I've put together there, is getting to that place where for me, it's being able to like, okay, this journey is about knowing the unknown, but the whole concept of it is being able to get to that place where like, okay, I don't know a lot about this. I don't know about everything, and I need to figure out like, okay, how do I get to that optimal place of knowing not what I don't know? Okay. And then there's this statement that I absolutely love to close up this section, and we can move to the next one, and then don't worry, I'm almost done. Is Moment of doubt is not a sign that you lack ability. It's a signal that a task is harder and a sign that you are stretching your skills. And I think this, and it's Adam Grant who said that, it's basically it's like this whole idea that doubt in the journey of rebuilding isn't a bad thing, but it's just trying to be like, okay, yeah, I'm actually stretching my skills and potentially I'm stretching the skills of my team and it's a good thing. But just remembering this couple of principles that really helps me. Okay, chapter two done. Chapter three. Are you still here with me? Yes. Awesome. Great. All right. Chapter three is the intentionality to self. The foundation of building teams and tech is the ability to invest. There's a couple of words missing there, but we can talk about that when it comes to investing. So, a lot of those things I said, a couple of fellow tech leaders are in the room, they're like, it's a lot of things, it's very draining process. It's true. This part of my job that I definitely do not like. And there's a couple of it that becomes very hard. And when you're doing all of those different things, you're managing a couple of those different things, it can become very draining very quickly. And you get to a place where you're like, okay, how do I build some sort of, you know, mom momentum and all of those different things. But I think this last chapter is basically this being intentional with yourself also about some of the things that you can do to invest in yourself. It's probably the last point, but it's the foundation. If you have to think about the pyramid, it is the foundation of the whole thing. In order to manage a great team, you've got to be able to manage yourself and you're going to be able to invest in yourself. So, this is where we begin. So, one of the questions that I, I want to pose to the room is what does your self development as a leader look like? I'm just going to pause there, create an awkward silence for everybody to think. But what does your personal development look like? I was shocked that we're already in November today. We basically, Vilani mentioned that we have 60 days left to the year. When you began the year, there were so many different plans and things that you wanted to achieve, <laughs> invest in yourself, dreams and visions, and all of those different things. But like, a lot of it you wanted to invest in yourself, but the truth of the matter is, like if you're not really intentional about investing in something, it's definitely not gonna happen. One of the quotes that I read the other day was like, if something doesn't have space in your calendar, you're probably not going to get it done. But like, what does your personal development as a leader look like? What are some of the things that you're putting in place to really invest in yourself? If this whole journey is learning the unknown and learning things that you don't really know about, but how do you invest in yourself? Personal development encompasses a lot of different things. You can be working on your soft skills, your technical skills, and so many different skills. But like, what does your personal development look like? Chances are, as tech leaders, you are reporting to somebody. And when that relationship with your manager is a little bit broken, that could affect your personal development. But if you are committed to your team, the ask for the business should be that somebody should be committed to you as well. Otherwise, it becomes a very unhealthy place to work at because you're going to be pouring so much into this team, building this great team. Meanwhile, you're completely depleted because nobody's investing in you. But I think if you're intentional about your personal development, chances are you advocate for a lot of things to invest in yourself. So what does your personal development look like? With two months left of the year, think about it. It could fall into the next year, but if you're not really intentional about it, it becomes harder. 
With that being said, um, do you even have the time carved out in your calendar to really invest in yourself? Another question for you there. This section is more about just some questions, some reflection points for everybody as we close off very quickly. One of the statements that I read very recently in this, um, in the title that I mentioned, uh, the illusion of explanatory death, is basically this statement that says, the people who don't know about a subject should not be able to judge those who know about the subject. Ouch. But I think as tech leaders, like I mentioned, like with building this humility to invest in yourself, when, when you don't have those principles, you don't really know how to admit when you're wrong, you don't really know how to ask the right questions and all of those different things. It becomes harder for you to judge people who know about the subject, who are probably well known, uh, like they know more than you. Once again, I don't want to be an MVP, but I want to be able to have key questions that really unlocks things. And I think that's my role as a leader. My manager, my current manager, she's awesome. She's best in the UK. She's great. One of the things she explained to me, she's like, when we start, I started my end up, yeah. should be everybody awesome. I run a stand up for my own life. It's pretty brilliant. I love it. It's just a team of myself. Anyway, I love it. But the whole idea of stand up, if you're not really familiar, we ask three questions. What did you do yesterday? What, do you, what are you doing today? Do you have any block? Three simple questions. You're trying to figure out like, okay, awesome. How's the progress going? And the blocker is for you as uh, a leader, as a manager, to be able to help them unlock all of those different things. So I started doing that every quarter to be like, okay, in this quarter, what did I do? Okay, what am I doing in the next quarter? It's basically being intentional with myself to be able to really help me improving and really growing. So I ask myself those questions, trying to figure out what do I know? Okay, did I reach some of the goals that I set for myself? And so on. But it also becomes a reflection point for me to be able to be very intentional about some of the things that I am putting into the next quarter that are really going to be investing. Some of those things is about the team, specific individual, but also it's about myself. What do I want to achieve out of that? It doesn't really help us to have a big goal for a whole year if you can't really break it down. Because when you look at the whole year, at the beginning of the year, pff, we all had goals and like 12 months, I can get it done. But now with two months left, you start rethinking like, okay, pff, maybe I can't really get it done. But at the same time, also chances are, it was a pretty big goal and you can't really, you didn't really break it down. That's why I run a stand up for myself to be able to really ask, okay, how do I break it down? Uh, you might need to find another rhythm for you, but I think a <coughs> quarter is long enough to really be able to see, to move the needle on something. Because I feel like a month is just too short. Or two months, I just feel like it's just not really there. I feel like a quarter is an optimal space for me to be, really, to be able to be intentional about some of the things I really want to invest in myself as a leader. So maybe you'll be able to find out what is your rhythm. Maybe it could be a month, I don't know. But I feel like, like I said, it's not really a formula. You're just trying to figure it out because we are all completely different. But there's key principles or common threads that we can really be able to grasp and really be able to invest into as leaders that really, really unlock certain things. Okay, awesome. Um, and then I think one of the things that I also mentioned here is that um, being intentional about your rest. What does taking leave look like for you? Do you have a rhythm? Before I got married, I was terrible at leave. I only took, I only took leave once a year in December. That's it. I only took leave. But I realized but very quickly, I started feeling burnout because I'm like, I worked for 11 months in the whole year and only took months at the end of the year. And in December, I didn't want to see anybody at all because I wanted to rest. But figuring out what is that rhythm that you want to be able to follow. So it could be one of the things that you have to be really intentional about your rest. And not just you and also your team. Like how do you become more intentional about really getting them to be able to take time off to be able to replenish themselves? You don't get to a place where you're completely run and empty and then take a break. But as a leader, I think you start building the art of knowing this person uses about 80% of the tank capacity. It's probably a good time for, be, for them to be able to take some time off. But when you start building that relationship, you become more human, you start listening to them. Your advice becomes, start actually echoing more volume in their lives because 
you took time to really know exactly what's going on in their lives and they can really listen to you. Okay, almost done. And um, <coughs> okay, awesome. I have three more, three more, uh, three points when it comes to this idea of the intentionality to self, which is just to summarize exactly what I was kind of being able to do uh, to say now is. Number one is the intentionality of self-development, the intentionality of leadership style and leadership principles. Are you, one of the questions that you probably hear a lot is, what is your leadership style? It sounds very fancy, like, what is your leadership style? What does that sound like? And all of those different things. But I think on that journey is, you have to really be intentional about it as a leader to be trying to figure out like, okay, what really works for you and what doesn't work for you and like, what does your leadership style look like? Basically encompass some of the values that you have. That's why we started with the whole idea of finding out your purpose. But ultimately your purpose will start influencing some of the key principles of your leadership. And then lastly, as I close off, is this whole idea of the intentionality to longevity. The whole idea is, you know, you want to be able to do this for the long run. You're going to be able to have a career that you really build and all of those different things. But like, in order for you to have longevity in the career, you got to be intentional about certain things. You got to be intentional about growing because once you leave this job, you want to be able to be marketable. Like what are some of the things that you've achieved here and so on and so on. But also you got to be intentional about your rest, growing and all of those different things. But I think when you are, one of the things that I realized with some of the engineers that I have, the more junior they are, they just want to see the here and now. My role and my journey becomes in trying to get them to see a little bit ahead, seeing a little bit ahead. That's what the exercise, the tour of duty I do, so that they can see beyond just the stuff, <coughs> they can start seeing a little bit ahead. But I think for me, for you also as a leader, that idea of longevity and trying to see beyond the here and now becomes very, very much important. Awesome. Is that helping anybody? Yeah. Yes. All right, next slide, please. I think, yes. Oh, and I think this whole idea, just to close it off, it's basically just a call to remember. We tend to forget the things we should remember and remember the things we should forget. That's not a quote, it's not mine, but it sounds pretty good. Anyway, that's a picture of me a couple of months ago. What happened was, uh, like I mentioned, I, I love CrossFit, I love working out, and a Sunday morning, I went for a 5K run, came back and I was going to do an emo, which basically stands every minute on the minute. It's a very CrossFit style. So for every minute you do an exercise, when the clock goes off, you move to the next exercise and it's kind of like a circuit and you do it and you don't rest for the time. So it was a 30 minutes emo basically. But because I was already, I was exhausted. I think the night before we went out with, for dinner with friends, got home pretty late and all of those different things. I was absolutely exhausted. After the 5K, I should have called it quits, but I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a perfectionist, I'm a type one. So I'm gonna commit to the plan that I set at the beginning. Anyway, getting to the, my garage gym, working out, I'm on the 12 minute of the imam, of a 30 minute imam. I'm doing great, 12 minutes is brilliant. I'm like, I can see the middle, I'm getting there. And I'm doing a specific exercise, Megan, you know, it's basically called a power snatch. What it basically means is you have a barbell with weights, and then you basically start off a squat and then you pull it and the specific technique that you do because the goal is to get the bar above your head and then to squat. Sounds pretty intense because it is. It's one of the most complicated exercise to get. Anyway, so I'm basically doing that exercise. I did it already. At this time I did two rounds. I have three more rounds to go for my emo. Anyway, I'm doing the exercise. I forget to check my form and to actually connect because I was completely exhausted. I, for I completely forget about the form get there and I'm pulling the bar and then at this point when you're pulling the bar when you get to about just above your knees your hip needs to get involved and then you basically kick your hip forward and it helps the bar get above your head so it's very sounds simple it's a bit harder than that but it's basically the whole concept the specific you know the specific forms that you're gonna follow to help you to get to that end goal but I completely forgot to do that which basically meant that I pulled the bar and the hip didn't connect I completely pulled the bar right in front of my face and the bar completely hit me <laughs> and I fall, I fall <coughs> off and then that's basically what ended in, in the emergency room on a Sunday. Anyway, 
I'm like I fall off. I like I don't know exactly what's going on. The dogs are losing it and all of that. My wife, she, I didn't even scream because I was just kind of like lying down there, <laughs> contemplating my life. I'm like, what did I just do? And when I touch, I saw blood. Anyway, I go to the bathroom. I check. I'm like, oh, I'll be fine. And my wife wakes up anyway. She's like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm great. I just have a little bit of, a, you know, being a man. Anyway, I'm like, I just have a little bit of a cut here. She's like, that's not a cut. You're like, your eyes completely out. And my mom is a nurse anyway. So I call my mom. I'm like, hey, do you think I could just put a plaster on here? She's like, are you mad? I can see it opening up because it's just above your eyelid. Anyway, so get rushed to the hospital and then I have four, st uh, four st stitches and all of those different things. But the whole idea was that to be able to accomplish that specific exercise, there's specific forms that I had to follow. But I completely forgot to do all of that. This whole idea of building great teams, if you don't remember the things you know you should do, very quickly, you start, it's gonna become disaster, uh, a disaster for you and your team. So this whole idea, as I close off, is would you just get to that place where you start remembering some of the things? Just kind of putting things in place Things that you know already how to do, but maybe you got very busy and all of those things. Just remember the things that you should remember. And looking after yourself becomes very important. And then being able to really build the team becomes very easy for you when you've really invested in yourself. Last slide. All right, this is just some key takeaways. You can take pictures of that. But basically, when we looked at the idea of the pursuit, we looked at like the pursuit should look like a mix of a science and art. Rethink the way things have always been done. That is basically what we looked at. I looked at in that specific uh, space. The rebuild, we look at the idea, which is the illusion of uh, explanatory death. It's basically a psychological term. You can research it. It is absolutely brilliant. It is really, really good. And then basically the whole gist of it is that our belief that we understand more about the world than we, we actually do. It's often not until we are asked to actually explain a concept that we come face to face with our limited understanding of it. So if you had to ask somebody, oh, how does tax work? I don't know, just take 15% from my, you know, that's it. Anyway, but there's a lot more to it. A lot of people claim that they know it, but it actually doesn't really know it. Anyway, one of the ideas that they talk about there is like, if an alien had to sit down with you and ask you about explaining the idea of a house, how would you explain it? Really don't know. It's just four walls protect us. Anyway, so it's like you very quickly start realizing that this concept that you think you know but you actually don't know until you're asked the question about explaining it. Anyway, that's basically what we looked at. And then we looked at the two of duty. I just kind of put it together there, which basically is like, hey, over the next one to two years, I want to XX so that I can XX and possibly add in the direction of X to the future. And then you break it down into the short term medium term and long term it's really how to build engineer and really look at the career forward and then the intentionality to self just kind of being able be intentional with your self-development being intentional with you dis uh, discovering your leadership style and your leadership principle and uh, being intentional to building for longevity and then one of the reflection points the quotes that i mentioned there was which was moment of doubt is not a sign that you lack ability it's a sign that the task is harder and a sign that you are stretching your skills, which is usually that you're heading in the right direction. And the last one is, what do we think we understand the world more than we actually do, which is the actual title of the of this specific point that I mentioned there. So if you search it on Google, what do we think we understand the world more than we actually do, you get this study, it's absolutely brilliant. So anyway, uh, next slide please. Anyway, so like I mentioned, I have focus for like specific quarters and this is kind of like what my focus for Q4 looks like. One of the things is I want to build clarity. Clarity is basically the possibility of sight. And I want to be able to build vision as we're planning into the next year. That's what it looks like for me. And then one of the things I want to be able to character, that is another one. And then the last one is rest. Because as we're heading into the last of the year, I want to be able to be intentional about rest. Next slides. I think it's just some contact details. If you want to reach out to me and then last slide. Awesome, Q&A, awesome. I hope this was insightful, at least just kind of provoking thought for any one of you. And uh, yeah, that is me. Thank you so much.
know we are almost out of time, but I'll take some questions if you have any. Yes. Sorry if you already said it, but like, how long have you been in the tech lead space? I was a tech lead first. I'm an engineering manager now for almost three years. Yeah, but I was tech lead for two and a half, three years. Well, no, two and two and a half years. So I've been with Luna for almost five years now. Yeah. Any other question? Yes. Um, when you do the, the tour of duty and yes. you encounter someone that doesn't really know where they want to go, what are some of the prompts or things that you do to, to kind of encourage them? Very good question. I think by being, so I attend stand-ups for all my teams. The goal is to be able to understand what they're working on and all of those different things. But also, it becomes very important to know how long on the journey they are in already, right? So I think if it's somebody who's been in the journey for, you know, they've been coding for five, ten years and they still haven't figured out, we have a bigger problem there. But I think usually one of the people I encounter who don't really know, it's usually juniors straight out of university. They're just trying to figure out, they try front end, they try back end, they don't really know. Or sometimes mid levels with kind of like shifted careers and all of those different things. But the whole idea starts with knowing exactly on specific projects what really passionates them. There are chances that the specific project that just got them very excited. But at this point, I would have given them a specific project to either lead or a specific feature, if the project is too big, a specific feature to be able to lead, which should have touched on specific skills to be able to see how they connect the team together. So I basically use some of those things where I'm like, okay, what are some of the things that really passionate them? Some of the problems that really excite them. So in a one-on-one, -on -one, I usually ask people like, okay, what are you reading? What are you coding? Do you have any side project and so on? And from there, I can be able to establish what are some of the things that really excite them? And then from there, I can start putting in things together. But it becomes more of a journey rather than here's a plan, execute it for the rest of your life, you'll be a great engineer. It's kind of more like, okay, awesome. You don't really know? That's perfectly fine. Let's focus on just the short term. Let's just focus on this year and next year. What are some of the things that you want to do? But chances are also there are some seniors in the team who do influence a lot of the juniors or people who don't really know. They will be able to like say some of the things that ask them, okay, in the tech space or leaders, what are some of the people that really excite you or some of the people that you connect with? And from they just try to be able to, access, uh, to kind of understand. But it starts with this whole idea of what are the things they're passionate about, what type of problems they really want to solve. And then from there, you'll be able to establish that. Because I think in the tech space, you can have either somebody goes in the indiv what we call individual contributor path, which is they don't want to be managing a team at all. They just want to be coding. That's perfectly fine. But in that path, like I mentioned, we have the engineering uh, ladder. It's basically like they can move to the point where they are pretty senior on the path, and that's perfectly fine. But the specific things that you do at, this, uh, at every stage of their career to help them, but it always starts with what problems they, what type of problem they really want to solve, what passionates them, what get them excited, and then from there it becomes a journey and like, hey, for now, they just focus on the next six months or the next year, short term plans, okay, here's some problems. And when also just really having things like a retrospective on a project, after a project, not just as a whole team, but asking the person like, okay, how do you think that project went? Did you enjoy it? Not so on. That's basically, that's why the tour of duty, I only do it usually after about six to nine months after managing people, just so that I've given myself enough time to understand, okay, what they're working on, they've worked on quite a few different features, they have different experience, so I can see what really helped them. Yes. Uh, thanks, Joel. Uh, I learned quite a bit uh, today in the, the conversation. Uh, I'm very curious to know from your <coughs> In one of your last slides, you spoke about the short term, the medium term, and the long term. Um, how, how do you, what are some of the key characteristics you see in a member of your engineering team that points out, you know, that this person in the short term is probably going to be a great fit in the long term versus, okay, this person probably won't be here long enough uh, for the medium term. So like, what, what are some of those key characteristics? as an engineering manager that you're able to identify in people in your team from the beginning? Yeah, anyway, so I work with Elani in my consultant cap capacity with the Lula team. So he always has a very hard question. As a CEO, he's, 
yeah, you always have tough questions to ask, so it's always very interesting. I think for me, for every single one of the teams, I want to be able to build a culture that really works well with everybody. And I think from the culture, it's not just me setting some, some things together, you know, hey, here's what we're trying to achieve and all of that, but it's basically getting, to, getting everybody to get involved in what is the team that we're trying to achieve. Because chances are, it's very easy, like one of the things that I read actually this morning, they said that great engineering teams is a collective effort of everybody. When you have one person who doesn't really pull in the weight, it, involves, it, like it, it influences the culture. That was kind of me paraphrasing, but basically that. So by being involved in the culture of the team, very quickly I start realizing, okay, how all of those different things kind of work. But being able to really ask the person, okay, what are you trying to achieve? I start seeing what are some of the ambitions. And sometimes people's ambition outgrow the company. And that's perfectly fine. But in that journey, I need to be able to understand exactly if they still are being able to add value to what we are committed to. Because I can see that, I can easily pinpoint, okay, this person, two years from now, they might not really be here. Because the problems we are trying to solve, sometimes they would have outgrown them. Sometimes it's just like, I can see how they're involved in the culture of the team and all of those different things. And then from there, I can start being able to start establishing all of those things. But also you have people who are just, the ego is just a little bit too big for the team. And very quickly with those people, you know, you just kind of have to make a decision as a leader what really works for you. Because I think in the engineering space, you just get extremely smart people. And who are very humble, you get extremely smart people who are very cocky. And the way they go about it, it doesn't really work because with those people, whenever they make a mistake, they screw up, they are not the first to recognize that they made a mistake and very quickly it just doesn't really build a company or a, a product. So I think for me in that journey, being able to understand exactly like, okay, how committed are they to the culture, how committed are they to the team members and the people they are working on and then from there just trying to figure out exactly what it is and you know, one of the hardest things for me, I think, as a manager to get to that place where you can have a conversation with somebody is like, yeah, I can see you won't be here for a long time. It's probably the hardest thing to do. But I think that honesty and being able to give them a re like why you think that way can do two things there. It can either make them very curious or they'll be like, oh yeah, I know it. And be cocky about it and you're like, oh yeah, great. Yeah, I just knew it and all of those different things. But I think it's just like, it's a combination of all of those different things. But people who are not committed to the, like being able to involve in the team, I think usually it's a really good indication you can see. Yeah, but sometimes, you know, the problems is just, they outgrow the problem, they outgrow the company. And it's probably usually best for those people to be like, hey, whenever they're ready, you just give them the blessing. But I think at the end of the day, it just depends on like how, you know, the style of which they want to exit, or at least like that relationship, you're like, okay, because some people exit, you know, <laughs> not the best way, but <laughs> and some people are just kind of like, oh yeah, like, okay, I'm still committed to this and all of that, and you can easily transition them, and you're like, okay, yeah, great, so, yeah, hope that answered that. Yes? Uh, what are some of the things you do in your daily, I guess, habits to keep you inspired, the team. Yeah, yeah. there's a couple of things, but I think for me is I have a really weird schedule, so I won't recommend it to anybody unless you, you want to be like, anyone, anyone. <laughs> so I wake up every day at 4.30. I go to bed at like 9. So that makes sense if you look at it, right? It just kind of makes sense. So I wake up there, there's things like I exercise in the morning, um, I pray because that's my faith and that's my value. And then from there, I usually listen to a lot of different podcasts. And I tend to not really stick to a specific genre of podcast. So I'll usually be like the tech space, the business space, the health, transports. I usually will be with things that people can't go without. Just kind of listen to different podcasts and all of that. I consume a ridiculous amount of podcasts. I think per day usually it will be about two to three hours. Usually as I'm running and I'm exercising, I tend to just kind of really listen to all of those different things and all of that. And I think that really helps me to see exactly how, okay, how did these people build that company? How did they build the product? Like what really makes them? Like just trying to do a little bit more research, understanding and all of that. And I think usually problems just excite me. 
but also understanding seeing other people win and how they executed the plan really tends to excite me and i think that usually really helps me and then the other one also is constantly really thinking about like okay where's the company heading where are things going and being able to clearly see that progression that forward momentum okay here's things that are happening and if it's not happening then i start asking tougher questions to the like to the business to my manager the boss and all of those different things and that usually really helped me and i think lastly is conversation with my team i absolutely love one-on-ones i think it's one of the best thing ever just kind of really pausing connecting and having conversation asking them some of the things and i really usually will find things and then some of the fun things you know for instance like you know asking people what are they reading what side project they're working on not because i want to spy on them it just it just really excites me to be able to see oh okay you're working on these side projects ah oh, send me your bit uh, no your github link i'll just be able to look at it and that usually will be able to help me i think the tech space has a lot of companies there's you know a company being born almost every single day you know and then with that i think you can easily find it as a threat or you can find it as a great opportunity for you to be to, to figure out okay what problem are they trying to solve and how are they going about it in the execution and then from there just kind of making notes oh okay maybe the execution is flawed here oh this execution is brilliant what makes it exciting and it really helps because sometimes i feel like in life you have mentors that you never meet purely because of just like consuming some of the content and i just approach that approach that and i just have i have good friends and mentors you know uh, like i mentioned i think the way i got involved with lula and velani it was just just genuinely con- like asking questions i'm like how are you trying to think about that i'm trying to think about that and then very quickly realizing oh i can add value here oh maybe not and then just kind of being able to constant obviously microsoft talks about being a, 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 a learn it all not a know it all and i think that humility of heart is something that i'm trying to really approach to be like okay i don't need to talk about how smart i am i'm probably not that smart my journey is to try to figure out how do i get smarter every single day by just connecting with people consuming content asking questions uh, deeper questions so i can get to the optimal answer of like okay how did they get to that so that i just improve my learning so yeah thanks What's your favorite one? <laughs> <laughs> it's tough. Uh, I'll probably be the last one. Um, oh, it's a tough one. So I like After Hours, the TED Audio Collective. There's these three prof- uh, professors from Stanford, I think. And they have conversation, I think. They release it every Wednesday. After Hours is absolutely brilliant. Every week they, talk, they tackle this different topic. I find them very fascinating. So it's these two guys and a lady called Yanmi. They are absolutely brilliant. There's that, there is Rethinking by Adam Grant. I like a lot of the TED Audio Collective. It's very good. And then there is Far Flown. Uh, it's basically, they, are pro- they look at different countries and like some of the things there. Um, uh, from a fitness perspective, I like the, the Nike one. I like the Nike uh, training center uh, uh, stuff there. And then there is Stephen Bartlett, The Diary of the CEO. It's a brilliant one. Uh, they're a little bit longer. They usually tend to be like, the shortest one is usually like a 40 minute one. So it's usually a brilliant one to consume also. And then uh, there is uh, Jay Shetty, uh, who, who used to be a monk. He wrote a book of, uh, you know, how to be a monk or something. Anyway, he, he has a podcast also about health and overall so it's quite a few different things there but i'm like i can definitely send you a list but like yeah it's quite a few different genre but it's really cool but right now diary of the ceo and after hours are like top of my list awesome anyway thank you for enduring with me and then uh, i hope that was a little bit insightful and uh, my details are there i'm i'm keen to also share the notes later. takeaways <laughs> I like I like how you split into multiple components because I think those are all different talks that you can actually have like you can actually have a specific talk about like finding your purpose specific talk about the talk duty and everything around um, uh, as a tech leader how you can improve yourself and something that resonates a lot so I think collectively 
we can all agree that your team is very lucky to have you as a manager at Luno. So thank you so much. As is customary from the tech leadership community, we'll give out a book to a speaker. So we'll be in touch after in a few days and then you can let us know what book you want to us to get and we'll get it to you uh, as a token of thanks. And that comes from Benny, who's one of the co-organizers, company called Matchbox Solutions. So they sponsor that book. Um, and then everyone, thank you for coming and joining us. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, we have a tech leadership newsletter that will go out at eight today and it will go out once every month. So if you just go to our website, techleadership.co.za, just look for the newsletter link and you can sign up if you want to receive content about tech leadership and everything that can help you become a tech leader yourself. And then we're also on Twitter at uh, Tech Leadership X. Um, and we will have another meetup in December, first Tuesday, but it will be a virtual one uh, on Zoom. So if you want to join that from home, feel free to do so. Final thanks to our sponsors, uh, Peach Payments. So Peach Payments and OfferZen, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to OfferZen for having us too today. Uh, and check them out if you're interested, peachpayments.com and OfferZen.com. And uh, finally, to wrap up, I didn't quite get booked.